Today we are focusing on thinking in systems when looking at the world of health by talking with an expert that has worked alongside politicians, financiers and academics to create effective health and healthcare policies. This is for any listener who wants a career in health, is curious about crafting policy that bridges between disciplines and those interested in the growing field of system thinking. Here is our conversation with Alexandra Torbica, professor in the Department of Social and Political Sciences at Bocconi University. Alexandra, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Virginia. It's a great pleasure. We have been part of the FD Talent Challenger together with Bocconi University. You met some of our challengers and bright students from all over the world that ask you so many questions about the future of the healthcare system. The very first point that I would really love you to explain to our listeners today is more about you. I think it's not one of the first career choices to enter in the health and healthcare world. And basically, how did you become so close and so passionate about health and healthcare? Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. To be honest, as long as I can remember, I was passionate about health and health-related issues. And I always knew that in one way or another, I would end up in this sector and build my professional career in health, healthcare related areas, because I haven't, you know, haven't had a super clear idea of exactly where my career path will uh, bring me over time. So I started from a very narrow view on health and uh, healthcare, thinking that it's only about medicine and medical doctors and medical profession. And this was some, some, some exclusive domain of this discipline. And by studying more, growing up and exploring more, I learned that health is much more than medicine-related issue, that health is the crucial, it's the pillar of all other activities, economic, social activities of individuals in the community. And unfortunately, I think that's a really, really clear concept to everyone. And now also thanks to the pandemic that we have been experiencing globally. So over the years, uh, this passion started from a very, you know, close niche about medicine related issues and, you know, looking into the drug development, so related more to the producer side of the healthcare technologies. But then I got really interested in this complex interactions between health and other uh, socioeconomic components that actually influence health and how health can influence them. And Alexandra, you make a very clear distinction between two words. What's the behind reasoning that you're using every time you define health and healthcare? Well, health and healthcare are two different, of course, related concepts, because the health of an individual and a community of a population as a whole is influenced by many different factors, among which healthcare is one of them. So having a good functioning healthcare services, access to appropriate drugs, access to hospitals, doctors, technologies, innovation, and so on, which is the component of healthcare, is only one of many other determinants that impact people's, uh, people's health. So indeed, over the last 20 years, I have been more focused on the healthcare component in the sense that how we can improve the functioning of healthcare system to maximize the health of a population, knowing that health is also determined by other factors. And uh, again, through pandemic experience, more than ever, it has become so clear what these other factors are and how the health of humans is connected also with other type of health, those of animals, those of a planet, and how the factors like uh, peace and security, food supply, access to clear water, education, income, access to correct information, social behavior, how all of this influence the level of health of individuals and populations, which are beyond having a good functioning healthcare system, which can only do the part of the story. Absolutely. And I think this is such an important point because um, it leads quite nicely to what we are seeing. It's uh, very interesting for generally the FT Talent and the Financial Times audience, but it's all the relations that we have between policy making and uh, all these complex systems, one of which is definitely the healthcare one. And um, secondly, one other point I think is about technology. I would love to ask you, Alexandra, what is your perspective when it comes to the collateral damage to the environment that 
of course, technological innovation sometimes is causing, but as well, technological innovation is improving. How can policy in a certain uh, uh, way balance all these tension that we see in innovation, potentially both hurting and helping our goals for better health and healthcare system? It's a rather complex, uh, I would say a million dollar question, because indeed finding this uh, balance is very, very challenging. I think that the first step, and this is something that we have been arguing through the work that we have done in the Pan-European Commission for Health and Sustainable Development, is to define and acknowledge this interconnectedness between the human health, animal health, and planet health under the framework of one health concept which is not a new concept. It's something that has been around for decades, but it was more academic uh, issue that scholars uh, have been debating about. But in the policymaking, in the real world, in the real life decisions, we haven't seen so many examples of actual application of this concept. So by embracing the concept of one health in which the barriers between environment, animal and human health are overcome, we can also include the way we evaluate technologies that can, on one side, help us make these connections. Think about digital health solutions that can track uh, links between human, animal, and planet health. But on the other side, when we evaluate technologies uh, before, because policy makers have a great responsibility of setting the criteria, how to evaluate technologies that come to the market, even in healthcare, we have systems, of course, evaluation, even more than uh, in other sectors, because patients and populations have to have access to safe technologies. I would love to ask you something about the career approach to, into the health uh, world. Basically, uh, when we are looking as well at technology and uh, definitely the use of uh, data, big data, when it comes to healthcare policy, it's uh, an integral part uh, of the policymaking process. If you had to recommend the kind of skills that uh, someone should, uh, you know, learn and nurture to really enter in this complex industry, what would you say in terms of data and tech? It has become evident, again, also through the experience of this global challenge uh, brought by coronavirus, how much you know, the data are important. And I think that somebody said that uh, this pandemic is the most measured event ever in human history. And we have collected so many data in order to inform policies. So the capacities and competencies to analyze data, to interpret them, to make them useful, then to inform decisions, whether they are uh, business decisions or policy decisions, I think that's a key competence that in the future will be increasingly, it has been always requested, but now we all these opportunities with the technological innovation to collect data, big data, artificial intelligence, data scientists, the way that we call them, in order to analyze this data and again provide. But a word of caution I would like to share because the risk is that once we are uh, so concerned about technical expertise, so you know, algorithms uh, and uh, you know, all the things we need to know in order to analyze correctly the data, construct our databases and use these tools, there is a risk of losing the big picture. And the big picture in healthcare is really this 360 degrees understanding of the context in which these data are being analyzed and what are they for. So the interpretation of the data, how to read the information that we have available and how to uh, use this evaluation in order to inform policy making. This is something that I have always been striving for also in my research, to do research that at the end could actually make the difference for the real life decisions. Technical competences, uh, which also my university has been invested a lot in the last years uh, in order to train the new generations of professionals professionals with these technical skills. I welcome that a lot, but I also welcome that these competencies are somehow complemented with a more specific knowledge about the context in which they will be applied to. And health and healthcare provides a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges as well, if they're not properly studied and understood, because health and healthcare are different from other markets or economic sectors in which we can apply these competencies. When you add to work with very different people from so many diverse backgrounds, how did you go working with these different mindsets and different people? And would you have any suggestion for someone that is approaching the healthcare system as much as any other complex systems and needs to have this open mindfulness approach to work together with diverse backgrounds? 
I'll be completely honest with you, Virginia. When I was invited by the president, Mario Monti, who you may know is the ex-prime minister of Italy and has been a European commissioner, to be his advisor on this pan-European commission for health and sustainable development endorsed by the WHO Europe. And um, when I started that fascinating journey, it seemed to me like uh, closing the, the, the circle in my professional career in which, which way. I have spent 20 years or so of my academic life teaching health economics, healthcare management, health policy, mainly to the medical profession, uh, telling to medical doctors, pharmacists, people working in the system, working for the healthcare system, also people working for the healthcare industry, but uh, indeed focused on market access issues and so on of the technologies about the importance of economics and management and policies to so social science component to improve the functioning of the healthcare system. So somehow economists teaching uh, uh, medical doctors about the importance of numbers. On the other side, you know, I found myself in this commission with economists, finance people, with the top level. Somehow I was the only one or one of the few uh, there were some representatives, uh, uh, again, in the scientific board and also some commissioners that had medical background about the importance of health for the economy. So it was uh, the loop that, was, uh, that I found really fascinating. So as soon as I felt that there is space for my ideas and my thoughts, I took that space and, uh, you know, got the courage to make proposals. And I was fortunate enough to have the support also of this uh, prestigious uh, group. But at the end of the day, I really figured that it's true. It may be scary sometimes that you, you feel you would not be able to contribute. Uh, but then it's all about, you know, starting. It may not be successful every time, but at least you start the discussion not fearing it's going to be a failure. And in that sense, you know, you gain confidence because you find on the other side uh, uh, really the, the openness and this open-minded approach from both sides and building the bridges between disciplines in order to tackle the complex issues, because that's the only way. Not, there is no one single discipline uh, that can really uh, face what we are facing in health. That was somehow for me, again, an eye-opener that allowed me to make this translation and conversation in different languages. And I think this is such important skill that uh, sometimes it's very hard to acquire and nurture. But I think once you get how to communicate with uh, different people from different backgrounds and being able to walk in their shoes, it's not just a matter of professional relations, but it's also a matter of uh, human relations. And I think this is really important when we are talking about uh, empathic leadership and how to be able to influence people. I would uh, love to ask you, how would you recommend for those beginning their career, how they can be open to unexpected opportunities and also be flexible with the changing their minds. It's true that, you know, and this is the advice for our young listeners, that uh, you need to find your trigger, your niche, your passion, something that really uh, fascinates you, drives you, motivates you. So, you know, the topic, the field, for me, it was, as I said, health. However, within this drive, within this motivation, be prepared to open your eyes, open your hearts to the new opportunities because things will change in life. There are so many things that we cannot predict and we have learned that even very well over the past few years. What is important, and once again, this is something I learned maybe ex post, is really to understand what are your values. So whether it's, for example, like in my case, it was really about uh, contribution to the society, making the difference, uh, uh, trying to be you know, as rigorous, as excellent in my sector as possible, using scientific knowledge to make the difference in real life. So finding the values that drive your choices, your career choice may change. But if you stick to your values, uh, you will not have the fear to make these changes and make, you know, take the new road because you will have these guiding principles that will put you in a safe place. What's something that new job seekers most of the time think is true about the health industry but isn't? Once again, I may be biased, but uh, I really think that those aspiring to work for the healthcare industry not only should be concerned about the technical competencies of a specific function they want to cover, but even more importantly about, again, the sector in which that company operates. So it is not true that you can just, you know, a one size fits all type of approach, apply some of these competencies because understanding the context, for example, knowing much more about the public sector, which is one of the main stakeholders of the healthcare industry, being the healthcare industry, the most regulated 
industry of all economic sectors because of the different reasons that I'm not going to into today. Understanding the reasons uh, underlying this regulation and the limits that the healthcare industry has in order to operate in the market because of some public goals uh, that it has to pursue is a key. So again, we are coming back to the very first point about a really, really important uh, um, awareness about combining the technical competencies of something specific to a more general knowledge about the context in which this competence will be applied. For the healthcare industry, it may also require, again, knowing about, for example, about how government function, which is not necessarily in the minds of young professionals who would like to who aspire a more business-oriented career in this field. Now it's time for questions. If there is something a bit unique about this talent show podcast is that we are welcoming our early career professional students directly in the podcast show to ask our experts their questions. And we have uh, two challengers, Samuel and Francesca, that do have uh, some questions. So uh, Samuel does have a question for you. My question to Professor Alexandra is, what are the most exciting healthcare technology innovations that you've been keeping your eye on? Thank you, Samuel, for this question. Indeed, the recent years have seen uh, really uh, the boost uh, in technological innovations uh, in, uh, in healthcare, and there is a range of them. Some of them I had the opportunity already to work on also in my research. I would say that what fascinates me the most uh, in the recent years was the application of artificial intelligence to healthcare. So the uh, support to medical doctors, professionals uh, to make decisions uh, based on these tools is something that will definitely revolutionize the way we operate within the hospitals or healthcare providers uh, in general. Recent years have seen this rapid development in artificial intelligence technologies, and I think this trend will continue with more diffused application in health and healthcare. This technology gives enormous opportunities, but again, also has a lot of challenges because, again, in terms of implementation, in terms of you know where you draw the boundaries in the use of this uh, type of tools in order to treat patients and make decisions about the patients and so on. So far, we have seen it uh, applied mainly to diagnostics and detection of diseases, so to assist uh, discovering a disease using the data available, the big data. But I think this will have much broader applications in the future and needs to be assessed and managed appropriately in order to have its full potential. So if I had to name one, I would really uh, talk about artificial intelligence and all the you know, also machine learning tools that are used in order to apply it to the healthcare sector. Thank you, Alexandra. And our second question is coming from Francesca Giovanni. How can digital health make a difference to tackle the issues of our century, from social inequality to climate change, through the One Health approach? How can we make the most of it to invest in prevention and early intervention? Thanks and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Francesca. Again, it's a very, very important question. It has many sub-questions in it because we talk about uh, equity, inequalities. Uh, we talk about the connection between the human, animal, and environmental health. So let me just address one of those. I think that the digital um, innovation and digital health uh, can really be the most powerful tool we had so far also to address inequity of access, for example, to healthcare services in the population. While 10 years ago, we would talk about digital divide and we would talk about the fact that not all the population had access to digital technologies. There is still maybe some generational issues, but if you, we think, think about today, even in the lowest middle income countries, access to cell phones, so to potentially some apps that can be downloaded on a smartphone is much, much, much higher. So having you know the opportunity to reach and to get to the patients, to the people, to the community, through the digital technologies can really uh, be the booster of uh, increasing equity of access, so addressing inequities uh, within society that we observe and we have observed a lot with pandemic. On the other side, these tools can be used again to connect the flows of information about human, animal, environmental health, as we have uh, also seen uh, in our FT challenge when we had some brilliant ideas about the startups in low and middle income countries on how these technologies can serve for this purpose. 
where you can use a platform, just thinking of the winner solution, in order to connect information about, you know, some specific viruses that can, you know, jump from animals to humans, uh, about environmental related health risks in the community. Digital technologies can really be a tool, first of all, to increase awareness about this, which is already a very first but very important step, and then actually as an instrument really to Uh, operationalize the concept of One Health by bringing this data together. Alexandra, thanks for being part of the talent show and of course about your insights and anything that the, our listeners want to know more about your research, your career, as well as your expertise. Don't hesitate, of course, to tap into our podcast links to give you all the full understanding of what we just discussed and of course of Alexandra uh, interests and the researches. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for being with us. It's been a pleasure and uh, up to the next episode. Thank you so much, Virginia, for hosting me. It was an absolute pleasure and up to the next occasion. Thank you. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, Noor Hafez and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Luling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zecca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time and keep listening. <laughs>